In this section, we'll discuss curvilinear one-dimensional systems. Often in a dynamical system, we can have motion in two or three dimensions, but fixed to a curve or a surface. So for instance, if you imagine we have a bead attached to this wire, the bead can slide back and forth along this wire um, and so, in principle, it can move in the x and y directions. However, because the bead is trapped on the wire, there's really only one degree of freedom for this system. In other words, if I tell you what the x position is of the bead, that's, that fixes the y position, because this curve is defined as a relationship between y and x, or if we have motion in three dimensions between z, x, and y. And so, Although this looks like motion in two dimensions, it's really one-dimensional motion. We really only have one degree of freedom. So the book asks us to consider um, or to show that we can describe the kinetic energy of motion for this system as just one-half m times the displacement s uh, along uh, times the displacement s dot squared along the track. And so S here is basically the displacement along the track as measured from some reference point. And so if you take a time derivative of that displacement, square it, multiply it by the mass in a uh, factor of a half, you get the kinetic energy for the system. Likewise, we can show that uh, the forces tangent to the curve, meaning forces that point along the curve here, that tangent force is what drives an acceleration along the curve. So F tang is going to be equal to M S double dot. So let's see how you can show these uh, two relationships. Okay, so now let's think about a very small portion of the curve whose curve length is, is uh, DS. Since the portion of the curve is very short, we can imagine that the curve is not actually curved, but is actually just the hypotenuse of a right triangle. And so the uh, displacement along the x direction, we'll call that dx. Displacement along the y direction, we'll call that dy. And now we can write the arc length ds squared. So that's the arc, this little tiny arc length squared. That's going to be equal to, according to Pythagoras' theorem, just dx squared plus dy squared. Now it's important to keep in mind that these are infinitesimal lengths. So they're really, really short. And so this only this relationship only holds when we're considering so small a portion of the curve that we can treat it as a straight line. So it doesn't hold for finite uh, displacements along the curve. Okay. We can then divide this uh, whole equation, both sides, we can divide it through by a, a little bit of time squared. Okay. And so keep in mind that this is a little bit of time a second, a microsecond, a millisecond, some small number of seconds, um, and we're squaring it. And so we'll get an expression, infinitesimal length, arc length squared, divided through by a little bit of time squared. Now this is not the same thing as the second derivative of the arc length with respect to time. Those are not the same thing. This is a velocity which we have now squared. And so we find that the time derivative of the arc length squared is necessarily the change in the x component uh, with respect to time squared plus the change in the y component squared. And so now you can see how this is going to lead to in our expression for kinetic energy. So coming back to our standard expression for kinetic energy, one-half mv vector dotted into itself. So now very often, remember, this second term here we treat it as v squared, but it's really the velocity vector dotted into itself. Now this expression makes no assumptions about the coordinate system in which we've expressed the velocity. We can express the velocity in Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z, or polar coordinates, or cylindrical coordinates, anything we like. This expression holds true no matter what the coordinate system. And so it's up to us to choose the coordinate system in which to express the velocity vector. And we've seen in previous sections that if we express the velocity vector in, say, polar coordinates, we can get kind of a complicated expression as compared to when we express it in Cartesian coordinates.
But just hold that in mind, that's an important idea. So now if we want to calculate what the velocity vector is in Cartesian coordinates, which is what we've used up to this point now, it's going to be, of course, the velocity in the x direction times x hat plus the velocity along the y direction, y hat. And so if we dot the velocity into itself, you can see that we're going to get dx by dt squared plus dy by dt squared. And we already showed that that's going to be equal to ds by dt squared. And therefore, the kinetic energy can be written as 1 half mv, excuse me, 1 half m uh, s dot squared. Now let's look at relating uh, the acceleration along the s direction. Let's look at relating that to the tangential force, f tang. Now at some point along the wire, uh, we imagine that our, our bead is subject to at least two forces. There are forces along the direction of the wire. We'll call all those forces f tang, so the forces tangent to the wire. And then there can be forces perpendicular to that, normal to that, so we'll call that Fn. And so our total force applied to the bead stuck on the wire is going to be F tang times a unit vector which points tangent to the wire. So there's a, at every point along the wire there's a unit vector T hat which points in the direction along the wire. And then we have the normal force and that's going to be multiplied by n hat, so that's just going to be uh, a, a vector which points normal to the wire at every, every point in the wire. And of course these two vectors are going to change as the bead moves along the wire, but they're well defined at every instant along the wire, so we don't care what exactly their definitions are. The velocity vector, we've already argued, can be written as the displacement along the wire with respect to time times the tangent vector, right? So the velocity has to be along the wire. So there's no uh, normal component to the velocity by definition. Therefore, when we take a time derivative of the velocity vector, in other words, if we calculate the acceleration, we're going to have two terms. That's going to be the second derivative of s with respect to t, t hat, big t hat, plus ds by dt times t hats dot. So now, as we've seen in the past, this is a vector, a basis vector that's changing with time. Um, we've argued that uh, the basis vector itself, its change cannot point along the basis vector. In other words, uh, t hat dot must be perpendicular to t hat at every instant. And therefore, t hat dot must only have a component along the normal vector. Okay, Can't have a component along t hat. And so whatever uh, this component of the velocity of the acceleration vector looks like, whatever it is, it points along the normal direction, Okay, not along the tangential direction. And so if we apply Newton's uh, second law, m times the uh, acceleration, here's m times the acceleration over here, and here's our t hat component. Uh, remember this, this component over here is t hat dot, and I've already argued that t hat dot has to be uh, parallel to n hat, so uh, t hat dot is going to be some number, some function, whatever, times n hat. I don't really care what this is because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore this, this component when we go to the solution. And m times the acceleration of our mass has to be equal to the forces applied. So we have our tangent force, which runs along the t-hat component, and then our normal force, which runs along the normal component. We can dot um, both expressions, both sides of this equation, by t-hat to just consider the tangential components. And what we find is exactly what we're looking for. The second time derivative of the displacement is equal to tangent forces. So the tangent force, that's what drives acceleration along the wire. The normal force uh, acts in the uh, perpendicular direction.
And so this is an example of a system that, um, although there's motion in two dimensions, it's actually a one-dimensional system. Our arc length s is the dimension that we're interested in when we're thinking about the dynamics. And systems like this are, are can look a little more complicated than they actually are. Um, there's really only displacement. There's really only one degree of freedom.